if you like we're a little bit over time so okay so good morning uh, good evening everybody um today we would be talking about how to help ai help you reach your business goals and let's go immediately to the slides please bear with me while i am sharing a screen So before we go too far, let's talk a little bit about me and uh, what I'm doing. My background is in consulting and throughout my life, I was happy, lucky to have consulted on a lot of the big data and AI projects uh, that at the time when AI was just starting to be adapted in the business and industry. I am software architect at enterprise computing big data AI systems guy, and I was having four of the G Mafia, half of the Fortune 10, and many Fortunes 500 as of the places where I consulted or taught. Academic side, PhD in computer science, master's in engineering management, six Sigma master black belt, and currently I'm working on a startup that is using AI to improve the infection control. Now, that was about me. Let's talk about you. Who is this talk for? It is for the people who already know AI and machine learning methods, and they're wondering, okay, all that math is great. How do I actually make a business results with it and any difference? Also, this is for the researcher that is using data science in his research, as opposed to researching the core ML methods. And anybody else who primarily cares about making a difference or making a money using AI. This talk is not for the core expert in a field looking on how to improve the state of the art in the machine learning algorithms. I believe that you would be very disappointed when you hear that there would not be a single formula that you, we would be talking about today. And also this talk is not for somebody who wants to listen about intricacies of the latest AI models. My hope is that this talk would be usable to you in three years from now, at the time when the latest AI models change significantly. So what are we here for? Is to help you use data science to maximize your business results, to help you understand that what really matters is a system as a whole, as opposed to just particular AI algorithms and models, and most importantly, to keep you out of the trouble by understanding how many of these methods are going to break in the real world. We are also hoping to have a couple of minutes at the end for any questions you might have. So let's start by talking about who data scientist is. I believe that on this course, many people are actually not necessarily core data scientists and um, might be engineers working in other fields. And this big list of the things that are on the board right now is some set of the skills that you might hear data scientists needs. Machine learning, big data, math, operational research, et cetera, et cetera. Some people would also say econometrics, ec causality, actuarial sciences. Now let's be serious here. Do you really know anybody who is an expert on all of the previews? Data science is actually not a single job. It is a group of jobs. And on any reasonably big project, you might need a whole project team together to cover not only the skills 
that you are having on the previous slide, but actually just the subset of the skills the project would need. And chances are that you personally would miss at least some of the previous skills. And how it usually works, there is a good chance that the skill that you are missing would be the one that is most applicable to your project which is actually very good segue to the fact that working on machine learning and AI in academia and industry is very different. In academia, you typically choose to work on a problem in which you are the world's biggest expert or at least journeyman that hopes to become one of the biggest experts in a field at some point. In industry, you actually have to work on what the boss is paying you to work on. So you might actually be assigned the problem because you know more about AI than your colleagues do, even if you do not know much about the particular methods. And that goes back to the old joke, who is the expert? The person in the room that is the least ignorant about a particular topic. Well, sometimes that's you. So how do we run successful projects? How we actually succeed if we happen not to have eight concurrent PhDs, one in machine learning, one in operational research, one in the deep learning? What do we do? Well, you could take a bunch of the courses. You could ask people that have much more experience than you, do, than you do. You could read a lot, attend data science meetings, and you would learn a lot. And what would you learn are the things that are popular. It's in many ways going to be learning about popularity context. So you are likely to be listening about ResNet, Imogen, DALI. You might be having a lot of the discussion about intricacies of deep learning. You could be talking about Bayesian versus classical statistics. I'm giving this talk in September of 2022. So right now you would probably hear a lot about AI generation of the art or video or even 3D models. Obviously, there would be a lot of the conversation about infrastructure, Spark, Hadoop, all the cloud companies would be mentioned here. And this was constant in the last few years. How did it age? How well does it work? Well, let's first say something for the engineers. If your goal was to have a big salary, it actually worked relatively well. You could say that the people who had previous skills were very well paid. If your goal, however, is to have successful projects, well, not all of the AI projects in the industry finish being successful. So let's talk about how we could be in a group that is going to succeed. And before we go in the details of how to succeed and what to do and what not to do, let's really talk about how much difference algorithms make. And I'm going to not use the latest and greatest because methods need to age for a couple of years to really understand how much difference they were making. And I would go back to MNIST dataset. And today, MNIST is actually probably too easy for the most of the modern deep learning algorithm. But what was interesting was that many years of research brought us from very simple algorithm that achieved 3.09% error rate to very complicated algorithms that were achieving 0.21% at the time when 
it did not really make sense to continue looking at the MNIST itself. And how about research Gantt result prediction data set? This is from Kuhn and Johnson. And various algorithms were showing results under the AOC that were ranging from 80 to 95% successful. So difference is very substantial. In some cases, few percent, in some cases, 15%. That's nothing to smear about. But let me ask you something. If your data is completely wrong, how long do you think your end result can be? I suspect a little bit more wrong than 10%. So is the better algorithm where you should spend most of your time? Answer, as everything else in the engineering, is of course, it depends. And that is a good segue into talking about what are the trends that we are seeing in the machine learning. So what's going to ha happen? If you are just starting your career in the AI and, uh, and uh, related fields, and you are saying, let me learn the very latest of the algorithms, how did it work historically for people? Well, first of all, as we already said, there was a pretty good history of salary that people who knew scarce, uh, scarce algorithms and that had scarce knowledge actually were able to comment. But the big trend is that both AI and big data frameworks got much more powerful and much easier to use. And obviously market works. So if there, some fields are prestigious and well-paid, more people want to learn about them. So today you have much more people who know how to use existing methods. And also those methods progressed a lot. Developing new methods is now much more difficult and much more expensive than it used to be. Let's talk about each one of these categories in turn. So training basic model is much simpler. Deep learning had its big break 10-ish years ago, and at that time, actually getting deep learning to work required you to understand many details of how to set up big uh, data clusters as well as to implement the algorithms and basic object detection in which you just say this picture appears to be having cat on it was months of work. Today, all of this is much simpler. You have a lot of the things on both big data side and on the deep learning side that allow you to very quickly train the basic models. And some very basic object detection using the cloud solutions is something that you could very easily do in very little time. So easy of use is much simpler and hey, I could actually use AI, I could actually detect something on a picture is much simpler than it used to be. While using models and using pre-existing models or using the old models became much simpler, the development of the new AI, new AI models showed up to be much more complicated and for example, today, very few teams are likely to do state-of-the-art model and have the right expertise to do it. And if you're just starting, your chance of actually 
beating. The latest that Google put out is going to be relatively small. And suppose even that you collected the right team. It's not just a matter of expertise. First of all, you are going to need a lot of data and computer power in order to actually be able to train the model. And today, many of the AI models are based on a fact, uh, are very much dependent on you having enough of the data to train them with. And you need obviously to store all that data somewhere and have no illusions. This is a money game. The person with the most money has a significant advantage. And the reason for that is that the big models are very expensive both to construct and train. So most of the time, if you're in a business and in industry, combination of models, existing models being easy to use and reuse, and new models being difficult to develop, means that you would be most of the time reusing the existing models or maybe some amount of the transfer learning on top of that. We mentioned that the cost of training models is big. Well, let me give you an example. Clip, one of the modern models that is pairing text and images and saying this text description is good for this image, was trained for 12 days on 256 GPUs. Now, how much money that is, if we go by the recent pricing on one of the cheaper cloud providers that is offering GPUs, that would be 9K just for final training. Not for all the attempts that you are going to make to figure out what is the best architecture not for all the mistakes you are going to make and make finish with the layout of training being useless. Just if you knew everything that you needed to do, you would pay 9K just for the GPUs. Oh yeah, also, if you were working on DALI, you would be looking at storing 250 million image text pairs. That also doesn't come free. And that is just a little bit of the training at the end of data storage. AI experts of this caliber are not cheap and you would have to try many things over a large period of time. So we would be talking about situations in which million, few million or even $10 million might not go that far in developing the new AI model. So before you say, hey, let me figure out how to do things better than DALI, well, does your project even have a budget to develop a top model? Many projects in the business and industry, especially when you are one of the people who is first in doing AI in your company, are not going to have a budget to develop the top model. Second, if you are trying to learn and enter the new field, important question is how much time am I going to spend learning and how well it is going to age? If you spent a month learning and you could use it for 10 years, that's amazing trade-off. If you spend 10 years learning and you could use it for a year, it's obviously not such a great trade-off. Well, knowledge in this field ages a lot. Programming GPUs, GPUs used to be very low level skill. And when the first deep learning models or the first deep learning models accelerated on the GPU were done, you had to go very low level. But in the meantime, this whole AI business became very popular. And a lot of people started entering the field contributing and result was huge investment 
And today, you are highly unlikely to go to the bare bones of GPU programming. You are most likely to use at least something like TensorFlow or PyTorch. And that is on the very lowest of the levels in a practice. Today, you would be likely to just pick up as a starting point pre-trained model and see how well it does on your problem. So note that there is a trend. There is a substantial premium in knowing data details of the cutting edge techniques, but you have to use that knowledge quickly. And if you wait for two years or a year, that knowledge might lose a ton of its original utility. Now, all of you work in a business and industry. How long does your average project last? Does your knowledge sometimes even stay cutting edge for the full duration of the project? So that is also going to push you in a direction of can I reuse the models? And a lot of the AI providers were actually very nice and exposed some of their models in AI as a service model, in which you actually could use the model that is costed on somebody else's server. Which means that sometimes using those models could be very simple. For example, some of the latest and most mindshare commanding pieces of the AI work where in the AI generation of the images, you type the text description and you say, I don't know, I want Panda that is on this image and smiling at me. That is something that you could actually today use. There are things like a mid journey and people who use it to create the computer generated arts are not only not a data scientist, but some of them are simply artists. So as you can see, usage of the models is becoming very commoditized. And that is actually a very important trend, which means that when you use AI in a business, the best AI algorithm the intimate knowledge of the details, ability to tune it better than everybody else for most of the industry project is not going to be the most important factor for project success. And if you read too many news, you are going to get the wrong impression because if something is newsworthy, it's by definition not common. So yes, to finish in the news, you need these skills to actually have successful project in the industry, that's not always the case, that it is the most important. In the industry, you would be using a lot of the existing models, at least as a starting point. And good news is that this knowledge of how do I use existing models in the business and industry is much more stable than the latest knowledge about AI and the business problems. Actually, you might notice that some of this, uh, of these models that we would be talking about now are something that worked equally well a few years ago and is still going to work probably for the number of years. So where to put your time at? And for that matter, when you're running a project, what is the scarce resource you are most likely going to have? Most likely, you would be still early in the adoption cycle. By now, most of the companies had at least some AI projects that were completed if they're big companies, but chances are, that you still might be one of the first people to look at the data set you have quantitatively. 
which in practice means that the most scarce resource is your time. You could often apply data science in a multiple ways in order to get the result. You do not have to go to the latest and greatest algorithm. Something you grab from the shelf is actually often already going to produce a lot of the results. And if you could try to use AI on a multiple possible problems and you are first one who is doing it, you are often better off applying average data science algorithm on a problem that is having a lot of value that produces a lot of money than on actually and trying that on a couple of different projects until you find the money, the money cow, in, as opposed to just taking one shot and actually squeezing the most you could from it. Because how do you even know that the thing you're trying is actually the one where you could extract the most money or make the most difference? Which brings us to something that you should be aware of, that when we talk about types of analytics, you are going to see this taxonomy, descriptive, predictive, prescriptive. Descriptive is what has happened, predictive what would happen, and prescriptive is what should we do about it. The prescriptive one is the only one that really matters in a business. All others are there to support it. Because you do not make money when you know what will happen. You make money when you do something about it. I could know future perfectly. Money is still not going to materialize in my bank account. I actually usually have to do some action. And that action is something that AI is today terrible in defining. There is no AI model as of the time when we speak that you could say, hey, computer, how do I earn money? That is actually something that as a humans, you have to bring together, which is good because currently AI is pretty good in prediction and various form of pattern recognition. There is maybe some early work on a causality between cause and effect, but it is not good in, in, in actually setting up your problem in such a way that it could tell you, hey, this is a business action that should be taken. And that is good because humans are pretty good at it. And on the other side, we are not necessarily always good in a prediction. So the recommended approach is use your skills to define a business problem, as opposed to starting with the technical and AI idea. Then define profit curve, define machine learning pipeline, then look at it as a system and figure out which pieces of it are the best to optimize. Few minutes ago, I asked you, should you be optimizing and your algorithm or should you be cleaning your data? Answer is it depends. Sometimes you're better off cleaning the data. Sometimes you're better off optimizing algorithms. It's very different for every single pipeline. This starting with the business is controversial. Usually what we hear about is somebody learning, hey, AI could, for example, do something. They start playing with it then they say, well, maybe my business could use it for something. Problem is that when you do that, you're playing a lottery and you're playing a lottery at the wrong side. 
because number of the business actions you could take in a typical business is going to be very constrained. Doing business action requires actually being able to get people to do something. In order to get people to do something, people need to agree that they would be doing it. Most of the businesses could typically, at any point of time, do only a couple of actions. And we would see example of how this works in a practice if you start from a data, but number of the degrees of freedom that you have in a data is huge. There is always something in a data, you could try hundreds of analytical methods. Only some of them would be connected to the business. And that is going to be an example of something like this. Feel free to unmute slash send something over chat if you are, I am going to ask you to vote. Suppose that they have international business that allows me to make a profit of $10 million per unit. There is at least 100 units. And that I checked and everybody loves it organizations interested in the welfare of the units like it, people in various countries like it, governments like it, nothing here not to like, right? Tell me, is this a good business? Well, there are two ways to look at it. One is to say, hey, it looks like there is a billion dollars here. Another one is to actually say, and what is the unit here? If the unit is, I don't know, in improvement of industrial generators, well, is your company knowing the first thing about industrial generators? What if you happen to be, I don't know, publishing company or technology company? What if nobody ever entered the industry hall of all of you? You knowing that something could be improved is going to be awfully difficult to act on. For that matter, to speak of the elephants in the room. What if the unit is elephant? What if, for example, you figured out using data science that elephants, if they're relocated from one area to another, would be actually happier themselves? What if you could get elephant experts to agree that's a good idea? What if the government is willing to pay you to do that? Are you going to enter elephant howling business? Imagine having that conversation with your boss. So this is one extreme example, but the reality is that you could do a lot of analysis on any data. There are hundreds of methods published every week, and most of them could be applied on any data set you're having. However, how can you make that actionable? Most of the time, average project in a business and industry has to be something that you could tie to the business you know, and to the execution. And it has already to be in the area that your business knows about. Then it has to be something that is aligned with current direction of your company. There could be many other things, including internal politics of the company that might make some action possible or not possible. So if you start with the data, you are taking a lottery ticket. You are playing a game in which you pull one thing from the set in which there are hundreds of thousands of methods and hoping that you would somehow connect it to one of the few actions that the business could do at the time. That is not a good odds. Don't play that game. 
instead, what you want is to actually start by defining your business problem. It's very important for you to understand problem domain. If you are business savvy, good for you. If not, start learning or find a partner. If you are wondering where to start, there is a couple of books that are good start. And the trick is because you could do only a couple of things in a business at a single time. First, figure out what they are or talk with executives. Ask them, what can you do? Then ask them, so tell me, why didn't you do it yet? Chances are that you are going to get the answer of the form because I don't know something. Well, guess what? Here is your data science project. Now you know that if you could answer the question, it would be acted upon that the person already knows how to act it. In any business, educating market is extremely expensive. It's very difficult to teach people how to actually use the product they don't know they need. And it's relatively easy to sell the product that people actually know they need. Same thing applies for the internal markets in any company. If your project sponsor already knows how to execute on the results of your data project, you are actually in the tremendously good position. So now you know that if you could make it, it would be used, that you would not finish with a technically successful project that actually does not work. Now you need to define the metric for your project. So what should I use? Sensitivity, specificity, accuracy, F metric, intersection over union. No, neither one of this is a good optimization metric for your project. The only optimization metric that you should be using in your business is money. I know that we have a lot of the international audience, does not have to be dollar, euro would work just fine. And if you are NGO, non-profit researcher, there is something that is equivalent to dollars in your domain. There is something that you are trying to actually achieve. If you are a philanthropic organization, if you're trying to help the people, to how many people you helped that were in the need, you always should define something that has a business meaning. I hope to be able to persuade you about this. And this is maybe a moment when I'm going to ask you to make this a little bit more interactive. So Yusuf and everybody online, feel free to unmute yourself and maybe vote when I'm asking the questions or maybe even ask the questions. And I would give you a moment to unmute. I'm unmuted. Okay, so let's do one simple business problem, uh, one simple data science problem. I want to predict temperature, uh, temperature in a Toronto. And suppose that I said, you are a consultant on a project, you are checking, do I have a clue what I'm doing? And I am explaining you that I have a great data science model. I use longitude, longitude, latitude, sun cycle, winds, et cetera. And I'm explaining you for an hour what are all the features I used. And then you figure out that I did not ever use past temperature. 
I just made arbitrary decision not to use it. I'm not going to look at what was the temperature in Toronto last year or yesterday. Now, does anybody here feel that this is a good idea? I see some people shaking heads. Probably not. Probably not. It looks like that it's important thing. It looks that I should have actually at least looked at it, right? As opposed to arbitrary discarding it. Great, that was the right answer. Congratulations to everybody who participated. And the right answer is, of course, that you do not agree that you could remove independent variable just on your VIM. And if I doubt to try to save myself and say, hey, but you know, I look at the longitude, latitude, I look at the winds, I look at the sun, all of these things are somewhat related to the temperature. Am I saving myself? Are you going to buy this and say, well, yes, they are related, that would be fine. Or you are going to say, no, I don't care. You should still have used it, right? I suspect everybody is in that camp. So if this is what you do, when I give you the data science project, predicting temperature in Toronto, why are you doing something different when I give you a project that is in a business, do you really understand how your business makes profit? If you don't, and you are optimizing for something that is not mine, you just did what I showed you on the previous slides. And Yes, I know that some of the things that you put in a model might be correlated to the project, uh, to the profit. But guess what? You just told me a moment ago that you are not buying that when I do it. So I'm going to make this equitable and say I'm not buying when you do it. And domain knowledge would matter. If you don't know how to connect the things with the money, that's the big problem. And the big problem is that data science is combination of formulation, optimization, and evaluation. This is from Pedro Domingos. If you're talking algorithms, you are typically talking about optimization. And if you are using weak proxy for money, you are combining state-of-the-art optimization with approximation in the next step. When I was many years ago studying engineering, my first class, very first class of the engineering, professor said that the engineering is about using the slider or the micrometer screw to measure then using a chalk to put the line where you measured, and then using an X to cut. I thought that it is a good joke, but I understood that it's a joke, not actually a model I should be applying to the rest of my engineering career. If you are actually using state-of-the-art optimization, that would be equivalent of you doing very precise measurement. And if you are then just using some weak proxy for money, that's your X. Therefore, if you are executive, this is what you should say to all your data scientists when they present you evaluation metrics. Hint, executives are often afraid to say do not, they do not understand AI or evaluation metrics. And the reason for that is that many of those metrics look suspiciously like something that they were learning in a business school in a class of statistics. Also, 
many executives became executives because they love people and they don't necessarily care about intricacies of statistics. So they might have slept to the class. So now poor souls are thinking, I am supposed to know this. No, 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 stop. You are not supposed to know it. Actually, you're supposed to tell to your data scientist, don't tell me mathematical definition of evaluation metric. Don't, do not tell me what IMSE is. Tell me how this relates to anything in this business. When you do, you have one of the following situations. It's easy to establish relation, i.e. for every percent of accuracy, I would make $10 million extra. Well, guess what, Spike? If it is actually that simple, then why didn't you do that calculation already and put it on a slide? Why didn't you say, well, this is how many million dollars of dollars algorithm should be making? The second one, the business case is so obvious that no precise translation is even needed, i.e. I have artificial general intelligence that is smarter than Einstein. Obviously that would make money. Let me tell you two things. First of all, I would argue that very few projects would be in this group. Second one, if you are running project in this group, here is a simple test for you, a challenge. Call your CEO on his mobile phone at 11 p.m. on Saturday and see does he pick up. If you are a little bit reluctant to even try something like this, or your answer is anything but obviously he would pick up, then you probably are not having a business case that is so valuable that no translation is even needed. And third one is really problematic. It's actually not possible to establish relation. Why you did not put dollars there is that you do not know how to do it. And that's actually a huge red flag because it's a, probably a good proxy that somebody else would have that problem. So that in the reality, your project would not be used in a business, even if it is technically successful. Which brings us to what is a profit curve? Profit curve is simply a graph that shows you relation between technical metrics and the profit or the revenue or the utility. And it's how you translate your metric into money. This also brings us to why this is not taught in school and why you rarely see something like this in the projects that make the news. This pro those projects are having a profit curve that is shown on the left side. My goal is to publish a paper. I cannot publish, typically, a method that says, I worked for two years, developed new method. It works slightly worse than the best method that we know. So your utility is almost nothing until you beat the best previously published result. Then your utility is full. By the way, in many cases, after one you wrote one paper, you would move to the second one, which means that there is no, a big step function and that you would not get tremendous, tremendous additional benefit by improving that technical metric way above the currently best published result. In a business, your profit curve is usually something much more complicated. You now see why it is so important to start with a business. Because if I actually have 
a good understanding that something is actionable and could be worth a few hundred million dollars. And by the way, a few hundred million dollars is not particularly big number when you are working in the really big company. Then, if I could move very little in that direction using very averaged algorithms, something that I could pick off the shelf, I'm likely to be having very big business success. And it does not need to be a state of the art output. You know why? Because if you make a ton of money for the company, you are probably going to command pretty significant budget. That is when you actually hire the experts that would come in and tell you that you use the wrong algorithms and that they could improve it much better. Not a problem. If you are somewhere on the middle of this curve, do not wait six months, start taking money as soon as there is a lot of money. And that is a, how you start. Next step, when you are optimizing. Very few people take care about the whole system. Data scientists often talk algorithms. Business people often don't know data science. As a result, nobody thinks about improvement of the system while the customers experience whole system. In my book, I'm talking a little bit about how to measure that. And I, you could see that more in a book I'm going to recommend later, but let's use the remaining time to talk about some industry uses of AI. How do I put this in a practice? Well, how about AI assistant for radiology or ophthalmology? You know, when you go to the optometrist in United, at least in the United States, they take the image of your eye and they look at the retina and they tell you your eye is fine or not. Well, guess what? Diabetic retinopathy is very big problem. Sometimes people as secondary effect of the illness might actually have a problem with retinopathy and maybe even go blind. If you could improve early detection of it, this is clearly something that on the side of I made a difference is one of the more noble things you could do. There is AI that was even published a number of years back that beats or matches in diagnosing diabetic retinopathy on a medium to large scale, on a medium to large severity, beats average ophthalmologist. And guess what? In United States, you actually typically don't see ophthalmologists. You see optometrists that is below in the amount of schooling that they get. Industrial quality control. How do I make money here? Well, it's pretty obvious. I already know what the scrap rate costs me. Computer vision, for example, inspecting parts as opposed to human inspectors. Improvements in the workflow of the pharmaceutical industry. Note that there were many successes when we were looking at the COVID, but those successes were not, I found something that I never would have thought about. They were actually successes in improving the workflow. NVIDIA, DLSS. NVIDIA knew that a lot of the video cards I bought so that people could play games and that people would buy new video card if it is fast. They used deep learning to actually create the rendering pipeline in which the card could work faster while producing about the same result. On the same note, their competitor ATI came up with their response, they did not, from what I understand, use the deep learning, but they got the system that works good enough 
to actually be an answer and keep them competitive. This also brings up another interesting point. Would your user know the difference? Well, if I'm having two video cards next to each other and one has just a little bit more artifacts, then I know the difference. If I'm having one gaming computer and I buy one card, then I don't know the difference. And also for this seminar, there is much of work in using deep learning to accelerate physical simulation. Some other industry uses of AI. Do not feel that you should always use latest and greatest. If I'm to pull out all recommendation engines from all of the sites, the huge part of actual profit of many big data, big tech companies are going to disappear. For that matter, many big companies were even built on pre-AI models. So do not be afraid to use something as, uh, as old as, who knows, regression, because insurance industry was built on actuarial sites. And to have some cool example, Microsoft simulate Flight Simulator 2020 used AI to create digital twin of the earth. They take the map and reconstruct 3D world from it. Start always with a quick model. You are often the very first person in your organization that actually is using the model. And that brings me to the signal to noise view of the data science. If there is a lot of the money in a problem domain and solving just the part of the problem is worth a lot of money. And you know that looking at the profit curve using basic algorithm is actually something that is, that is uh, very useful. And you, often finish in a situation that people do not understand what is the causality of acquiring expertise versus what works well in particular domain. Are you sure that the people actually used the software, uh, that the people became an expert in a model first, then apply the model to their business problem? Or did they actually had a business problem, heard that particular set of method works, tried those methods, figure out that they work, and then became an expert by using them? Always ask, what is the best available model for my problem? Consider transfer learning. And end-to-end -end deep learning doesn't mean end-to-end -end training very often you could put a couple of the existing deep learning models together. Even big boys do that. Right now, you might be, have been hear, hearing about Clipforge, DALI, Dreamfusion. They do, use that exact situation. Now, let's go to the couple of the technical uh, big failure scenarios to avoid. Technical success that is never used in business. It's always your fault because it means that you failed to tie business and technology. And this could certainly have been almost always detected early. Project in many cases should not have been run at all. We can't get AI algorithm to work well enough. Well, did you start by asking what is the best published result in a human kind? If you didn't, why not? There is also one other thing that I would bring as a big thing for the 2022, and that is probably where we would finish the lecture today. And that is that you need to understand that time is very different. If one of the independent variables in your model is time, everything changes. It's not just that we are using different models. It's that most of those time series models 
predicted the future would be like past, but longer. And that does not work because passage of time is good at exposing change in underlying trends. So you may not be able to actually model what happens after changes in the world. And guess what? It's 2022. Many things already happen in the world that would be changing. A lot of the things, how the world is working, many of the existing models would be falling here. Don't be over-focused on state of the art. Start with something that is good enough from the profit curve. Also, you must distinguish between manipulable and non-manipulable variables. You cannot manipulate all the variables in your model. For that matter, if you do not know the phrase Knightian uncertainty, night as an, in a medieval night, then you probably should know it. Do you have any reasons to believe that quantitative model is something that should be applied? Or are you really just fitting model over historical data without having any reason to expect that past trends would continue? And there is obviously a whole bunch of problems in automating the Behave, reported be, uh, the problematic behavior. For that matter, be careful with reported results. Research community very often has a tendency to report under their own conventions. So for example, AI would often present, uh, AI generated art would often present the best result algorithm achieved. That works well, but autonomous driving is different problem domain. In autonomous driving, you care about the worst case. A lot of big data is bad data. Know the cost of favor, failure. And as a result, be careful with using a lot of the black box models. And with that one, I would like to conclude that results are determined by the whole system, not by the parts, that parts influence on the system is something that should be estimated and measured. Domain understanding is crucial for the project success, often at least as important as algorithmic understanding. And understand if you're just starting, how AI models age, how AI knowledge ages. This is my book. If you are interested in more details about how to create the metrics, profit curves, how to actually know that you are not working on the AI project that could deliver the techno technical success and never be used, you might find some more details there. And with that one, I would like to take thank to audience and Yusuf, are we, actually about to finish now or do we want to open this for the Q&A session if people have any questions? Very great presentation, first of all, Vekos. Thank you so much. Uh, if people have questions, they can ask them now. We're a little bit over time, but no problem. I think it was a good refreshing talk, not seeing any formulas because the whole week we actually saw formulas and complicated equation, so very refreshing. Well, that is very useful because at some point you need to build that AI model. But the real question is not, can I build an AI model? Chances mm. are that if you randomly choose AI model among hundreds or thousands that exist, that that AI model is not the AI model that you need to actually achieve anything in your business. Once you know AI models, the question becomes which one to use under which circumstances. My hope is that this talk brings you a little bit closer to answer of the, uh, on those questions. Definitely. 
there is something in a chat. Let's Interesting see. talk. Thank you. Well, thank you, everybody. And uh, if there are no other questions, I would like to I would like to thank to everybody. And uh, you could reach me over the uh, over the circle, and uh, my contact information I already posted there with the with the LinkedIn and everything else. Perfect. Have a great evening and Thanks. good luck. For, uh, good luck with the rest of the seminar. Thank you so much. Take care and see you soon.